Can I have everybody's attention, please? First of all, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming. It looks like we kind of dodged the snowstorms tonight. Um, we apologize for having a Tuesday evening event. We, we've been doing Wednesday evenings for 10 years now, and uh, the school had another um, activity going tomorrow night, so we did have to change everything. All the speakers were already lined up, and they all graciously were able to change that to tonight, so we are so thankful for that. Um, first, I'd like to thank Mountains Taxi, and um, at the bottom of your agenda, um, it does show Mountain Taxi, it's Mountains Taxi when you go to the website. If you don't put that S in there, you're going to go to someplace in California, I think. So, um, please, please make sure that you go to mountainstaxi.com, and um, we thank them so much for supporting tonight's meeting. Um, as we always do, and I do see some new faces, but we um, have presentations from 7 until 8, um, without questions, without comments, um, just full, I mean, I think we've got, you know, 13, 14 speakers tonight. So we'll run through everybody, you'll get a lot of information, and then at 8 o'clock, or right around 8 o'clock, we'll stop for an open house segment, and all of our speakers will be sticking around to talk to you, to answer questions, um, whatever, they'll have displays, there's lots of information here tonight um, about fire mitigation, about everything else. So um, please stick around for all of that. And first of all, we are going to have um, Steve Harrelson, who is resident engineer with CDOT. He is going to talk a little bit about update, updates with, with CDOT right now. Steve. Thank you. Uh, not too much active construction going on in this area. Our uh, next big project this summer is going to be in South Park. We're going to build five passing or four passing lanes and a turn lane on 285. The passing lanes, one will be on uh, the Fair Play side of Red Hill Pass, one will be on the South Park side of Canosa Pass, and then we'll have two passing lanes. Um, just in the middle of South Park there to, to allow traffic to get by those slow moving trucks and so forth. And then we're going to have a left turn lane at Elkhorn Road, which is near Como. There, that's the road that um, serves Indian Mountain, if any of you are familiar with that area. That job is under ad right now. It's going to, the bids will be opened on this Thursday, I believe. And we hope to pick a contractor and have them uh, on the ground working uh, the first part of April. Um, it's, we're hoping to get it done in one season. We're, we're going to add those passing lanes and also uh, completely repay that. It's uh, close to a 20 mile stretch of road, so it's a pretty significant amount of work. But no work um, on this side of the county line. Um, we are designing Pine Junction right now. We are hoping to get it on the shelf ready to advertise uh, in a little over a year. Um, we don't have any construction funds program for that yet, but there is hope or fear, I guess, depending on your perspective, um, that we can get that going uh, hopefully in a little over a year and uh, and get that built. What it will be is a, an interchange similar to what was built at Schaefer's Crossing or Deer Creek where um, the, we'll get rid of the signal and the left turn movement so it will be a, a bridge uh, where 285 is going to go over the county roads, and then we'll have little frontage roads to uh, provide local access. And hopefully, if we can get that signal out of the way, it will help things. Um, operationally, uh, this winter, and actually for well over a year, um, you all might be familiar with some problems we've had at Shaver's Crossing where people have been uh, getting sucked into the, if, if they're heading southbound or westbound, they get sucked into the northbound side. Um, we've done some striping and uh, installs a temporary sign. We've got a permanent sign that's in the hopper at the sign shop. It's going to be a large sign that delineates you know, two through lanes and then the right turn exit for uh, uh, Elk Creek Road. So hopefully that will solve some of our problems. We have been trying to get that fixed, um, but hopefully we can get it done before anything horrible happens. Thank you.
Next we have Don Smith. Don is the Executive Director of the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce. Don. Hello, Conifer. We have February, our beer tasting event, coming up this Thursday, if you'd like to join me on Thursday at Las Vegas Garcia's. Ironically, this is a fundraiser for a high school scholarship fund. And, speaking of which, it is that time of year where we're accepting applications for scholarships. So if you have a senior, if you know of a senior from Conifer High School that's graduating this year, of course, pursuing business, please have them fill out the application for a scholarship fund, and that can be found on goconifer.com, which is our website. I wanted to let you know that we do have new owners for the Conifer Town Center, which is the Safeway Center, and there is a new resident there, and that's Paula from Aspen Park Cafe. I can definitely vouch for her mochas and her chai tea. So we want to make sure we go and support her. It's a larger space. And then coming this summer, she'll actually be open a couple nights a week for dinner. So we want to make sure we support her over there. I also wanted to invite you to our annual award celebration that's coming up on March 8th. It's at Brooks Place. Hopefully you're a morning person because it begins at 7.15 a.m. But we'll um, be able to celebrate with me the leaders of our community. We want to make sure we're recognizing those that are offering outstanding service to our people in our area. And lastly, I wanted to let you know that I do have maps for you over here at the table. And we have a lovely lady named Sharon Trill, who's actually taping tonight, from the 285 Tourism Committee, which is a combo committee from the Platte Canyon and Conifer Chambers. And we're revising that map this year, so you'll actually have a new one. And they're absolutely gorgeous, but take one. This one's definitely still good. And it shows you all the good things to do between C-470 and Jefferson City on 285. Thanks, I hope to see you Thursday. Thank you, John. And next we have Susie Nelson. She's a Conifer Area Council Board member. She's going to talk about the development updates that you have with your agenda. She's also going to give a little update. Um, if you were at the last meeting, we talked about the Conifer Parks Master Plan. That is going. She's going to talk a little bit about that, too. Susie. Thank you, Shirley. Um, this is on the, the handout that you got at the door, and I just wanted to let you know that um, planning, the Jefferson County Planning and Zoning resol Resolution Revisions were uh, passed. The two pro or the, the proposed revisions allow backyard chickens and bees and consolidate the agricultural commercial corridor, industrial mobile home, mountain residential, residential, and suburban residential districts. They have all these documents on the Jeffco website. There are two hearings. One is with the Planning Commission Wednesday, March 6th at uh, 6.15, and then with the Board of County Commissioners uh, Tuesday, March 26th at 8 a.m. in the morning, and that is a Tuesday. And also, um, there's a zoning resolution revision um, related to water supply and wastewater regulations. This affects not only developers, but uh, residents as well. So there's a hearing for that that is um, with the Planning Commission on Wednesday, February 27th, coming up the week, uh, I guess, the week after next. And um, that's going to be at 6.15. Um, and then with the, that's the Planning Commission and then the commissioners on Tuesday, March 19th at 8 a.m. Um, the only other thing is that there's a new residential development application for Deer Creek Meadows subdivision with, I think it's supposed to be Sean Madden. It's, no, it says Sean or Sean. Okay, misspelling. Um, and the case number has not been determined yet. Uh, he wants to divide 6.2 acre, acres of land into three individual lots for single family detached residences. So that will be coming soon. Uh, when they get a case number and, and put that on the schedule. Okay, I'm on this master plan, uh, Conference Area Recreational Master Plan group, and we're just getting started uh, with new, uh, new developments to figure out how it will be managed. It does not have anything to do with parks and recreation districts or taxes in any way. There's no tax dollars involved. A new group called the Conifer Recreation Coalition, or CRC, um, is developing the plan. They'll be providing 
plan findings and they are going to be looking for stakeholders from the community. This is everybody that is interested in this group. Uh, they're going to identify what we need up here in Conifer for more um, recreational opportunities. They'll, they want input from the schools, they want input from parents and recreational uh, groups, uh, just residences, clubs, churches, any, anyone that's interested in being part of it. So uh, we are still in the steering committee uh, state and we will be going forward um, with the stakeholder process. This is like a two year plan that's, that's come about. So right now we're getting ready to write this uh, proposal for a consultant, to find a consultant to help us put uh, the whole thing together. So if you're interested, you can contact Shirley and give her your information, or you can contact me, I'm Susie Nelson, I'll be around until the end tonight, so hope that you're interested and we can get you involved. So um, if you'd like to see some high stress among principals, just call them about 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, Elk Creek, for those of you who don't know, is located halfway between Shaver's Crossing and Pine Junction. It's right up there on the hill on the left-hand side as you're heading up the hill. Uh, Elk Creek is uh, an amazing school. Um, what my background is that I taught at Jeffco for six years. Uh, I, before I becoming a principal, I ran Rocky Mountain Academy of Evergreen. Um, the other side of the hill. This is the right side of the hill. On the other side of the hill. Uh, for two years, uh, then I opened a charter school in inner city Denver. 
uh, before returning to Jeffco last year and um, was highly selective in where I wanted to go. I knew I wanted to come back up to the mountains. I knew I wanted it to not be the evergreen side. And so I chose a house over here and uh, looked specifically at Elk Creek Elementary. Elk Creek Elementary is one of the top, is in the top one and a half percent of all schools in the state of Colorado. Um, it's, it's huge. I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. Last year, our reading and writing scores were third highest in the district. Um, and it's, it's absolutely a fantastic school doing great, great things. Some projects we have coming up in the future. Um, we're working on realigning our book room uh, so that it meets the Common Core state standards. Those in elementary school say that students need to be reading 50% fiction and 50% nonfiction, which if you're an educator, you already knew that. Um, that nonfiction piece is really, really important. Uh, the other thing that we're working on and we've just started is taking a look at how our soccer field, I don't know if you've seen that brown soccer field outside of our school, um, but we know that there's a need in our, in our neck of the woods way over there um, for our parents so they don't have to drive so far. So we're looking at what it would cost to put some field turf in there and we're just in the beginning stages of pulling that together. Um, Jeffco came in, and the school district came in and said, oh, five hundred to $600,000. And I said, we could do that for better. Um, so we're working on finding different ways to pull that together. Um, what, else about, what else about Elk Creek? Um, Elk Creek has only had four principals, and the last principal, Joanne Marion, was there for nine years. So my job is to outdo her. So you'll be seeing me around for quite some time. My office is right next to the clinic, so if my voice is cracking, it's not puberty, I promise. Um, it's a second grade cough that I picked up right next door. I'll be here all night. Um, I think that's about all for me. I'll be around afterward if you have any questions. I love talking about schools. I love talking about what we're doing. And, um, oh, one last thing. You can't pick a bad school on the Conifer side. You just can't. Every school up here is doing great things. I know all of the principals. We just, they just hired a new principal down from Marshdale. Um, I know all of the principals, Wendy Woodland, uh, Becky Brown here, they're doing fantastic jobs. You can't pick a bad school up here in Conifer. So um, we're very fortunate to have amazing public schools up here. Thank you. great schools, we have a great community. Um, I just, it's just amazing what this, what this community does and what we have and what we're thankful for. Um, as you all know, it's been almost a year since the Lower North Fork fire. Um, what a horrific event. And we're experiencing another dry year. Um, we're in the middle of a drought. I mean, it's, it's pretty scary. So tonight we're going to be talking about what legislative and other changes have been made. And what must we all do to be prepared for the wildfire season? You know, I had a, I had a dream a few weeks ago. It was actually a nightmare. I, um, I dreamed that there was a wildfire racing towards my house. Um, and I woke up in a sweat thinking, oh my gosh, I still haven't done that video of my house. And I don't have my stuff ready to take with me. Um, no belongings ready, you know, ready to go. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I've lived up here 35 years. I was even president of the Inner Canyon Fire District. Um, I was evacuated last year, and I still don't. So I hope you guys have done better than me. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that there's some speakers here tonight that might get my rear end here and maybe some others too, so that we can be ready if anything happens this year. Um, and first of all, um, just a very, very short presentation. Um, our local fire districts are all obviously so, so important to us. And I just really want to introduce them, and they're going to talk for just, just a minute or two. We're going to give them a lot more time probably at the April meeting. So you'll be hearing a lot more from them there, then. But Bill, Bill McLaughlin is the um, fire chief for Elk Creek, and Todd Moore is here with um, Interpanion. And they will be sticking around, and they'll have a lot of information for you during the open house. A couple of quick things to uh, make this really short. Uh, we it looks like there will be uh, three slash dates again this year uh, for collection of slash. Uh, those dates are uh, right now just in pencil. Uh, we're uh, still working those out, but it does look like the first one will be at uh, Conference High School uh, on Father's Day weekend, as it always seems to be, uh, which is the 15th and 16th. Uh, the 
year Kenyan date is still uh, being negotiated at this point, uh, so we're not sure when that's going to be. Uh, let's see. Um, we've got uh, a number of things, uh, you know, a number of materials over there that uh, we encourage people to come over and take a look at, particularly uh, the evacuation guides uh, and kind of the preparation for the season. Uh, and uh, you know, we, I believe our, our Sheriff Mink will be talking a little bit about the, the changes to the um, uh, emergency notification system. Uh, but that's also uh, kind of included in that, that material. Uh, and then lastly, one other big issue that we've seen as an outcome of the, uh, of the fires, not just here locally, but throughout Colorado, has been uh, a lot more scrutiny from the insurance companies, uh, the underwriters, and uh, we've been hearing a lot about that. All of the fire chiefs in the mountains have uh, basically started to uh, meet to work on uh, plans for how we can uh, keep those fire insurance rates from going up any further and how to uh, you know, make sure that people continue to have coverage. Uh, we're anticipating that we can make some changes to the way the fire service is dispatched throughout the mountain communities uh, that will help that issue, but uh, we do have to recognize that that is something because of the fires that we're going to be seeing a lot of scrutiny on. So that's uh, unfortunately one of the, those effects of the fire that we have to deal with. Um, we'll talk more with Wildland Captain Luther Kenny. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, like Chief said, we got a lot of material over here, firewise, real similar to the stuff in the back. Um, we're here to answer questions for you folks. If you're in your Canyon district, we uh, have a program, we'll come out and look at your house. Uh, you just need to contact our uh, administrator, she'll get a hold of myself or one of the other guys on the Wildland crew and uh, we come out and visit. Um, we also have a, Intercanyon has a website, it's uh, intercanyonfire.org, and they also have Twitter and Facebook, uh, so we have a guy that's maintaining that, and we'll post the, uh, the slash collection. I think we had trouble manning the, the date we had, so I think that's the reason we're not sure exactly which date it's going to be, but uh, probably sometime in August. Uh, we're not sure, we may have an earlier one also, so check the uh, website as well as check uh, the emergency management website, I think, for Jackson County, they'll probably have that too. But again, thank you. Uh, stop back when we're done and uh, answer any questions you folks might have. Thank you. Thank you, Bill and Todd. And if we could have the county commissioners come on up. Um, did I mention how amazing our fire departments are and all the volunteers that work in those fire departments? to talk more and um, we'll have a lot more information at that meeting as far as all the, the slash sites and everything. So, good to go. Okay, well we've got all three of our county commissioners here tonight. Um, we have Don Brozier. You have all three of us this evening. So um, we're going to tag team it. Um, I get first, uh, first first shot here real quick. You've seen me um, quite a bit. Um, Don Rozier, uh, County Commissioner. I reside within District 3, which is where we're at right now in District 3. And I uh, was elected in, in 2010. And uh, I think it was Brian was up here talking. She's holding up the sign time. Oh, you are mean. You are mean. Um, talking about uh, story time at the library. Well, they slid in a, a picture of me at story time at the library. That's one of my great joys of being able to be a county commissioner. And at the Lakewood Library, I, I tend to volunteer twice, if not more, uh, a month at story time down there. Phenomenal, phenomenal program that the library has. Uh, just uh, as I go through my notes here, you'll see for uh, Colorado counties, I serve in the legislative process at Colorado counties. 
we go through and we look at all the legislation that is coming out. And I see Representative Tarot's here tonight, and we'll be talking about some legislation that's come out of the uh, Lower North Fork Fire Committee and uh, other um, items on here as we go through. If you look at um, our budget challenges, I always get the budget slides. Uh, we have been challenged as of late uh, for the past actually two, three years on our budget. Our revenues continue to go down. When you say revenues for the county, primarily, and we'll see later on in the slides, our revenues made up of property taxes that come into the county. We also have intergovernmental, which we look at state and federal government dollars that, that come back to the county for different programs. We also have three funds that have the, the biggest uh, hit um, this year uh, with major fund balance limitations, and that's road and bridge. We also have library and social services. And Commissioner Griffin will speak to social services uh, later on in the, in the presentation about how many additional people over the last couple of years have come in for some sort of assistance, whether that be housing assistance, food assistance, some sort of assistance to help them through these difficult times. Capital needs as far as road and bridge construction and maintenance. Our road and bridge, um, the transportation and engineering, they took over a million dollar hit this year in their budget. And we're looking at trying to defer maintenance as, as much as we possibly can while keeping up our ability to plow the snow, to fix those bridges that need to be fixed and to fill those potholes that need to be filled. But overall road maintenance and, and, and overlays are being pushed out um, until such time as we have the funds to, to do that work. Network capacity for our IT department, we're running out of space. Just like your home computer sometimes, you run out of space because of all those wonderful things that we, we, we put on our computer, we're running out there. And at the same time, our voting system. We have to spend this year for 2014 about $4 million to upgrade our voting system. In fact, we're not upgraded, we have to replace it because of state regulations um, in our voting process. So that's $4 million, even though 82% of Jefferson County residents vote via mail, we have to update and spend that $4 million to uh, update that voting um, equipment. With that property tax revenue, where did, where did the revenues come from in the county? The majority of that, 47.6% come from per property tax. The other from a small bit from uh, sales tax, that's an open space tax, and also for local improvement districts, and then the intergovernmental portion that you see there in black. What does your budget pay for? Primarily, if you look at the different departments here, you'll see from Board of County Commissioners, the Sheriff's to Development and Transportation, most of the dollars that you see that come into the county go towards um, overall salaries and benefits to providing services for all the residents of Jefferson County. As we approach our fire season, I want to make sure that you are all aware that I am representing you all, whether it be at Colorado Counties, Inc., whether we deal with legislation, and at the, like I did today, I was down at the Capitol talking to the governor and talking to some of our other electeds about what is going on looking at, at, at fire prevention, wildfire management. If you look at Senate Bill 1382 and 83, Representative here, I'm sure she'll talk about those in a little bit more, but those are still in the process. And uh, going through, if you would like, I have copies. I brought plenty of copies for everyone. If you want to know what that legis proposed legis legislation looks like, you're more than welcome to come up here and, and grab a a copy. As the chief mentioned, we're looking dry, dry, dry. As of last week, that is our map for Colorado, and you can see we're an extreme to, to extreme dry in Colorado, and that stretches all the way out in Nebraska, Kansas, and all the way up into Wyoming. And also, Real quick, talking about the code red and going there. I'm getting my time. 
Um, I'm very enough. And if you look here, if you have any questions, I'll be around. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Griffin. Why do you put me on the Thank you. I uh, I knew he couldn't follow his the rule of the time. His, uh, just anyway, thank you for inviting us here. We always enjoy coming up here, and thank you. It's not snowing tonight, and. It's, I'd really like to have more street lights so that I can see better. But again, it's so good to see all of you. And um, this picture was taken when I first was elected. I've been elected two times. And so, as county commissioner anyway. Uh, and this one was taken with a telephone camera by, not the pilot, but it's, we kept trying to figure out what we could use that for. So we said, well, county commissioner oversees the county. So anyway, that, that's it. But um, our human service department, as Commissioner Rozier was saying, we continually have to deal with this situation because it's really, really hard. When the economy is bad, then naturally all these people need to have more and more services. So we have had a lot of jobs, and we have a, a new one that says, just add one, meaning all the businesses, if you're able to add one person, that's going to help our workforce center drastically. The other thing is, is our open space is turning 40 years old this year, um, and so they're going to have a big party. The party for the park is going to be not in Jefferson County Park, but at Red Rocks. So anyway, watch for that, and if you have any questions about that, go to the website, get that information, and again, thank you, and Casey. <laughs> well, hi, my name is Casey Ty, and I am the uh, new commissioner. Wow, good looking guy. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> Uh, they asked me just to introduce myself briefly, real quick. I, I'm a longtime Jefferson County resident, went to Green Mountain High School. I worked for CDOT for uh, about over 20 years. Yeah, a great experience at CDOT. But I can tell you, after coming over to the, for the county, and I've been working now for about six weeks, this is a very professionally run organization. You can feel good about your Jefferson County government. Uh, the staff is very professional. My other two commissioners, I'm pretty impressed. They always are prepared. Uh, they always are challenging me. We, uh, we don't always get along on the issues. We may disagree. But I'll tell you one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you one thing. It's, it's been a pleasure to, to get to know them and get to work with them. So I'm really uh, uh, glad to be a part of the team. Looking forward to working with them for the next several years. Now, like I say, six weeks, I've got most of it figured out. Um, the fun job I get tonight is I get to ask for volunteers. And actually, one thing that makes Jefferson County so great is the time the citizens give back to the county. And this is an opportunity we have now. Uh, every spring, we ask people to, to sign up and join our various boards and commissions. We have over um, 300 different citizens serve on different boards and commissions. Uh, we have the Planning Commission, we have various other ones. And we really need our, our citizens to get involved. So if you have any interest at all, please check out the website. Uh, Jeff, Jeffco.us is a website there. And you can apply to be on a board and commission. And there's so lots of different ones that are that are available there. I'm going to highlight one or two of them. Uh, the Audit Committee, I'm an old auditor from CDOT, so auditors are always warm to my heart. And uh, so if you want to have any interest in finding out what goes on in, in county government, Audit Committee is a place to be. But there's a lot of good committees here you can see. Whatever your skill is, your talent is, we need you in Jefferson County government. Please uh, think about uh, signing up. So uh, again, we have lots of different ways to connect too. We want to get out the word to people about what's going on. We have Open Jeffco. You can watch our uh, our uh, board meetings or the Planning Commission meetings uh, on the video online. You can also check out uh, uh, email newsletters. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook. We have a public calendar. We want the citizens to know what's going on in Jefferson County. We want to get your feedback. And uh, we think overall that's what makes Jefferson County such a great place to live. So that's the end of our presentation. Again, thank you for inviting us up to town. I, I just wanted to say that we brought some information about what was accomplished last year. So they're up there on the table. So be sure to grab one. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, be sure and, and talk to them um, after, after the meeting. Be great. Um, next, we have Sheriff Ted Mink, and I think we have some um, very exciting new information, and he is going to share that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you all might be next, so just be there. <laughs> She's used to it. Well, good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, I think uh, what I want to speak about has been alluded to by Chief McLaughlin and uh, Commissioner Roger. And that's, uh, you've probably read about and heard about the uh, new reverse, we call it reverse 911 system, which uh, <clears throat> sends out emergency notices for, for this purpose uh, in the case of wildfires. The E911 authority in November of last year went with a new contractor for those services. Now the, the E911 authority is a separate board and you see that surcharge on your telephone bills and it goes toward the E911 authority. They contract with a service provider that helps us do those emergency notifications throughout the county. So all the cities and the unincorporated counties use the same system. And uh, the contract went into effect in November. We uh, did some testing, and hopefully some of you got the uh, test phone calls that we had. We pushed it out to about 340,000 different homes in the entire Jefferson County area. And uh, our response was just about, with it all said and done, about 74%, which is, a, 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 according to the industry standards, is very good. Now, that leaves 100,000 that we didn't get contact with, and there were a number of different reasons why. Uh, sometimes if you don't, it's a, if nobody answers the phone and keeps ringing, that counts as a, as a miss. Or you go to, it, it'll ring and then you'll pick up an answering uh, machine, that counts as a hit if somebody answers it. So the point I want to make is, we are going to continue to test the mapping part of that system, which kind of locates everybody, especially in the unincorporated areas, so that we can uh, be relatively safe in assuming that the mapping product they have with Code Red, which is the vendor, is, uh, is, is pretty well accurate. So we will probably, in this area in particular, do, uh, do some testing on that before the real fire season hits in the next couple of months. So be prepared for that. I also want you to know that with the new system, you've got to opt in again if you want your cell phone to receive those messages. So you have to go to our website, uh, jeffcosheriff.com, and it'll walk you through how you can opt in so that you can get those uh, emergency messages on your cell phone. It'll go to your landline. But we need you to opt in on the, on the cell phones. I know you know that hopefully uh, Chief McLaughlin alluded to it, there's material over here that gives the different levels of notification you will receive in a, in a uh, situation. Uh, level one is kind of warning you to you know, get your things together. Level two is be ready to leave. Because when you get to level three, that means get out immediately. It's uh, don't wait, just get out. You should be prepared if you follow levels one and two. So we want to make sure that everybody is prepared, like Shirley said. And there's information there of what you need to get prepared and to get ready. And uh, unfortunately, it is going to be a bad fire season. And we will do everything in our power to make sure everybody is, is safe and well prepared and has the information necessary. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is, you know those annoying things you get across your TV screen from the weather service? Those beep, beep, beep. This is a test of the emergency uh, notification network. We have entered into an agreement with them, too, as another method to get the information out. So they will only do it when we hit a level three. So if we push out a level three on a reverse 911, that will come across TV and radio. But again, that's leave immediately. Danger is imminent. So, Angela? you got plenty of time. Do you? You do. Would you like to come up here and dance with me? <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
So I'll, uh, we'll be around. We'll get a lot of deputies back here if you want to uh, ask questions a little bit later on. I know that uh, the fire department has stuff on mitigation. I can't tell you how important that is uh, for not only them but for us too. And to make sure that your property is, is mitigated. And that's all I have. Thank you, Tim. And next, we have Dana Reynolds, Director of the Office of Preparedness um, with the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And he's going to be um, talking a little bit more about that, that preparedness piece. And um, he'll also be talking about um, some of the changes that have been, been made. Great. Thank you so much, Shirley. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you so much for the uh, invitation. I really do appreciate it. As Shirley said, I'm with the Colorado Department of Public Safety, specifically with the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, and we partner very close with our sister division, Division of Fire Prevention and Control, and actually Paul Cook is here tonight, who's the director of there. So uh, if you have any technical questions on wildfire, direct them to him. Uh, but anyways, uh, my presentation tonight is uh, part preparedness, uh, part information, uh, part awareness, part education, really. Uh, 15 minutes to kind of talk about a very complex subject like wildfire really doesn't do it justice. But uh, I'll be available after uh, the presentation, just like all the others. I have a table set up in the back with all sorts of really good preparedness materials that we brought from the state. Uh, so we, uh, we uh, encourage you to come by and, and chat with us on some of that stuff. Um, a couple of things I want to talk about, I just want to preface the presentation tonight that I am providing the state perspective with my presentation. I uh, came up to the ranks of the state patrol and uh, spent 12 years there getting uh, to the rank of captain. Uh, last time I'm in charge of Homeland Security section and the Kayak Diffusion Center. I uh, migrated over to the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, which I love. It's just a civilian position, uh, but it allows me to get into all that stuff that I'm passionate about. Uh, so that's going to be kind of my perspective talking here tonight. Uh, also, I wanted to just throw a quick little blurb out about home rule. You know, Colorado is a home rule state. You've probably heard that term many times. Uh, what that means essentially is that local jurisdictions have uh, ultimate authority uh, when disasters occur for response and, and those types of uh, core things. What the state does is the state exists to provide resources to local jurisdictions when a catastrophe exceeds those resources of that local jurisdiction. So if they've exhausted everything locally, if they've exhausted their mutual aid with surrounding fire departments or law enforcement agencies and they, they need those resources of the state or the National Guard or whatever the case is, uh, that's, when those, uh, that's when it raises up to our level. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about WUI, that wildfire urban interface. You've heard that many times, the, some of the general threats of wildfire. And then we'll talk about a little bit about notifications, kind of piggybacking on what the sheriff talked about, and some of the challenges of evacuation. Uh, first, uh, just, just a brief discussion of the WUI, uh, housing and commercial development that exists in areas that are prone to wildfires. Areas just like Conifer. Uh, you have pockets of dense development, commercial, residential, a mix of the both. Uh, and we often refer to that as the red zone. It's in the red zone because it really concerns us, first responders, Homeland Security, emergency management, whatever the case is, uh, because that threat exists and there's, there's so much at stake. You know, I used to patrol in Jefferson County and Gilpin County, so I know that many of these areas up here, there's one way in, one way out. So, you know, areas like that, uh, you know, raise complications for evacuations and whatnot, so it's really, really uh, critical that we have that situational awareness of where those risks are, who's endangered, and, and what we can do to help present that. Um, I want to throw a little blurb up here, though, that, you know, as the state, we're not just focused on wildfires. We're focused on a whole slew of hazards and threats. You know, so they encompass everything from blizzards, which we've had none, uh, but uh, everything from uh, foreign animal diseases to pandemics to epidemics to tornadoes to flash floods. Uh, onto human threats like uh, active shooters to cybersecurity threats and all those types of things. But wildfire is and continues to be one of the highest priorities of the state uh, given the threat. But wildfire is not the only fire threat out there. I put up here um, a 
fire that occurred last year in Washington County out on the Eastern Plains. This was a grass fire. 45,000 acres in one day. Now that, to me, is astonishing. You're not going to see that in a wildfire. I don't care how strong the winds are. 45,000 acres in one day in Washington County. And the only thing that really you know, helped us out out there is the fact that it's sparsely populated. It's nowhere nearly as densely populated as the Front Range, the foothills, and those types of areas. But just to put on your radar, that these are the types of things that keep us up at night. It's all the threats and hazards. We have to look at the whole picture. Uh, our vulnerability to wildfire you know, spans multiple issues here. We have the drought issue, uh, beetle kill in the forest, which has taken an extensive toll across Colorado. Uh, lightning, we have the arson problem. And in fact, most of our wildfires either fall to one or two camps. It's either lightning cause or it's human cause. And when it's human cause, it's not always arson. Sometimes it's accidental. But uh, so those are really problematic. Rain flag warnings, uh, wind is a constant problem here. And we really uh, struggled with that last year. Um, but getting into looking back to last year, June of 2012, uh, this is just a chart from NOAA, which shows all the states across the United States. And you can see that Colorado was highlighted there in the red. It would, had the highest record temperatures for the whole month of the entire country last year, in June of 2012, uh, with that, which I think is astonishing. If we have a repeat of that this year, um, there's going to be serious room for concern. Uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor, I plucked this right off the internet uh, in preparing for the presentation. Uh, you don't need to focus too much here on the, uh, the chart there. But just know that Colorado sits there and you can see that we are still in the grip of a severe drought within Colorado. Now granted, most of it was really affecting the, the agriculture you know, on the eastern plains, but it really makes no difference because from our next slide, this is snowpack current as of February 15th of 2013. And as you can see right here, this is an average of snowpack year to date for 2013. And this is where we were last year, 2012. What does all this mean? <laughs> you put it better than I, than I could, but uh, yeah. Uh, there's there's reason for alarm. I mean, granted, March and April are snowiest months, and we're still crossing our fingers, hoping that we're going to get some decent snowfall. But if we don't, um, then things have the potential for being even worse than they did last year. Now, we have the benefit of hindsight, right? We have the Lower North Fork, we have Walla Canyon, we have High Park. In June of last year, we had 14 wildfires burning simultaneously across the across the state. Our state resources. Local resources were stretched paper thin, trying to manage all those simultaneous fires, and we, we're, we're poised to do that again this year if we don't start getting some much needed moisture. But the caveat is, is that I think we're going to be much better prepared this year. We have much better situational awareness of the threat. We have legislative action. We have first responder agencies like the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department revamping their E911 uh, systems, uh, trying to improve reverse notification. We're trying to improve our evacuation protocols. We've done a lot since last year to try to enhance our ability to respond in the event that the wildfire season uh, it, you know, looks a lot like last year. So what does Conifer need to do? Conifer needs to be prepared, first and foremost. We've talked a lot about these different provisions here for preparedness, creating defensible space around your home, uh, hardening your home if you're in the middle of a remod, or you're building a home using fire-resistant materials, removing excess fuels like that stack of firewood that's up against the side of your house. You know, it's all these common sense things. Most of these things are really common sense. Uh, adhering to open burning restrictions and fire bans and reporting those that don't abide by those to the sheriff's department. Uh, and most importantly, what I'd like to highlight on here is getting to know your neighbors. Did you know in, in very large-scale catastrophes and disasters, that in a lot of instances, it takes about 72 hours for first responders to get to your particular area, which means who are you relying on? You're relying on your friends, you're relying on your friends, uh, your family, your neighbors. Those are the people who are you going to have to rely on in some instances, depending on the magnitude of the threat or the catastrophe that we're dealing with. 
So now's the time to start knocking on doors, getting to know people that live around you, that are in your community. Uh, I mean, we say it all the time at the state level in Homeland Security. I mean, the time for us to be exchanging business cards is not after a disaster is happening. You know, we need to have built up those relationships with first responder agencies like Jeffco Sheriff or the local emergency management office. We need to have those relationships in place before before the red flag goes up and before the disaster strikes. Uh, another one here is your property accessible by firefighting apparatus. Uh, that was a big problem in some of the fires. So lots of these different bullet points, uh, but most importantly, having a plan. Now is the time to plan, and I have a bunch of resource materials in the back that you can take with you tonight when you leave about how you can do that. You need a communication plan. You know, what to do when the cell phone tower doesn't work because it got burned over in the fire. You know, how are you going to communicate with one another? Um, where are you going to rendezvous? Where's your meeting place? If you've got some people at school, some people downtown at work, some people at King Supers when the evacuation notice comes out, and nobody knows where anyone else is. So, a uh, bunch of different areas here, and uh, I'm kind of running out of time. She's got the uh, she's got, she's got the one minute sign up for me. I threw a bunch of education pieces in here just to try to uh, talk through those, and, and some of them I'll just hit on. That's white wind and embers are really the biggest hazard here with fires. That's how these fires spread so rapidly. Um, that was especially apparent in uh, Port Slow North Fork and Waldo. Uh, crowding occurs when the fire jumps from tree to tree. Uh, home converted from the inside out during a wildfire. You ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. The ambient temperatures of a wildfire can exceed 1,500 degrees. That's before the fire even reaches your house. So your couch, you know, your window shades, your rug combust inside the house before the fire even gets there. Uh, how fast will wildfires move? Uh, extremely fast. Uh, let's just go back to Storm King Mountain when 14 wildland firefighters died back in 1994. Uh, they got overrun by a fire, and then also the Fert Lake fire, which is, I think it's still smoldering up there in Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, flared up a few months ago, went three miles in 35 minutes. So extremely, uh, extremely fast. So I uh, threw a bunch of these in there. Uh, we talked a little bit about evacuations. Evacuations are all going to be dependent on the timing, how much lead time you have, and how many people have to evacuate. Uh, Waldo Canyon is and represents the largest uh, single area of evacuation in Colorado history for a wildfire. 32,000 uh, evacuees on or about June 26th of last year. It was an, a, just a staggering evacuation effort. Uh, so, and then I put this one up here because it hits home, close to home with all you. Which wildfire resulted in the greatest loss of civilian life? That's obviously the Lower Northwood Fire with three civilian fatalities. So, uh, lots of lots of concern with wildfire, and rightly so. You need to be concerned about what those evacuation notices are, how you're going to be dialed into your local jurisdiction so when those notifications go out. As I said, there's lots of factors affecting evacuation, egress from neighborhoods, lead time, number of people, and so on and so forth. So you got to take those into consideration. And how will you be notified? You know, as the sheriff illustrated uh, so pointedly here, that. Uh, Reverse 911 is not perfect. And in the Homeland Security world where I work, we always talk about redundancies and everything that we do with systems. And it's important that you are dialed in to as many networks as you can to get alert notifications if there's an impending evacuation. Whether it's NOAA, whether it's a smartphone app, uh, you know, whether it's reverse 911, whatever, having those redundancies in place so you get those notifications is key. So, uh, and here's a few other sources I plucked right off Jefferson County Sheriff. Sheriff, I hope you don't mind if it was left for a second. But uh, great resources there uh, to sign up. And that's really a neat little uh, thing here, Smart 911, where you can create your own profile on there and put things like your building plans, specific things about your house, how many people in your family, and those types of things. That's a, a really nice add on there from the county. Uh, limitations of 911, uh, the sheriff already touched on a lot of those, so I'm not going to go on there except to highlight the fact that no system is failure proof. That's why you have to you have to be dialed into your communities. A lot of times it might come down to sight and sound. You walk out, if you can see flames and it's windy, you need to get out. Um, you know, it's that simple. So common sense oftentimes prevails. And you obviously know that the consequences of not evacuating. 1,800 dead in Hurricane Katrina. 
and a lot of those were people who failed to evacuate. And we just had it again with Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I think about 30 killed out there, and a bunch of those were people who didn't evacuate from those low flooded areas. And, and, and I was following that, and they sent out those notices up and down and all around to try to get people out of those, those low-lying areas in the boroughs. So, so some helpful links here for you. Ready, Set, Go, and FireWise, those are the two big programs that we promote at the state level. And, and they're also the same that many of the local fire departments uh, volunteer or otherwise also promote. So I think we're all on the same page with that. But I'm happy to take questions and comments and concerns at the back. Uh, sorry, I went over a few minutes. She's going to throw me off the stage here now. <laughs> Amazing. She is so, so um, dedicated to our community and everyone she represents. Um, so, Sherry. I know. I know. And your time was cut short because of him. <laughs> um, we're, we're in about, I think we're in day 48, maybe. Maybe only day 40, I don't know. The legislative session started in the middle of June, June, January, January, that's what it was. Um, and, and you all know that um, I'm still on the Joint Budget Committee. We started in November. Um, there are four bills coming out of the Lower North Fork Fire Commission. I'm supporting three of the four bills. Uh, none of them would have helped the victims of the Lower North Fork Fire. None of them would have prevented the Lower North Fork Fire. Um, those of you that, that were watching and listening and reading understand that basically what the commission did um, was, in my mind, everything but what it was supposed to do. Here, here. Yeah, here, I know. Here. But anyway, so those bills are going forward. There was, the governor also um, passed, I believe, two executive orders. Uh, uh, Scott Apple was down there the day that they did it, and uh, Paul Cook, who's with the state, who's... Paul, wave your, yeah, there you go. Paul is, um, is working with the Department of Public Safety in the Fire Safety Division. If you have any questions, he is actually sitting on one of the commissions of the governor's appointment, so he'll be able to give you information on that. There will also be bills that are coming forward. Oh, and by the way, the point of the commission is they wanted a broad, um, a broad section of people that are involved um, with fire, that would be insurance people, uh, planning people, local government people, so that they could study the fire issue. I think we'll probably be having quite a few of those until, I don't know, until they feel we haven't had enough. Um, so that'll be starting very soon. Uh, the, the, I believe Claire Levy is also going to be running a bill uh, regarding insurance. Uh, also a bill raising, you know, I think uh, Bill Cadman, and I can't recall who's running it in the House, maybe it's Claire, are running a bill to raise the caps on, on, uh, on liability, the state's liability. It won't be removing the caps like we are attempting to do on the Lower North Fork fire victims, but it's just to raise the caps. And I haven't really looked at the bill. I, I haven't looked at the bill. Uh, my concern is all of these issues that we're going through. Really, they will have an they'll have an impact on all of our insurance rates if they haven't already had one on, on your homes. Um, so we've got that issue. We went through the gun bills in the last four days. I, I talked to Ted Sheriff Mink about them, and I said, which is probably a bad time for a legislator to ask his sheriff what he thinks about the bills. But I asked him as I came in, because I already voted on them. And I said, what do you think? And he said, They're, they won't do any good. And I agree. Um, one of them will probably take one of the companies in Colorado up in Erie. They'll probably move to Wyoming. And the other three are basically not enforceable. Now, I, I don't say this lightly because um, we were all affected by what's happened in the past and, and what we have going on in, in, in Colorado and across the country is, is very sad. I am supporting, uh, the governor's talking about putting 18.5 million more into mental health. And to me, that's where the real answer is. 
so hopefully those will be going forward. And, and just so you know, we're looking at about, we were looking at about between 600 and 718 mil, million more in our budget this year, actually because of a change at the federal level with some of the budget negotiations, that amount has gone down. Well, 45 million for this year and 100 million for next year. And by next year, I'm talking about the 13, 14 year. And remember, our budget cycles start July 1st. Um, the governor is also proposing, instead of having a 4% reserve, is proposing a 5% reserve, which would mean that there would be extra dollars. And he's planning on those dollars being used for firefighting. That's going to represent about a $73 million more. $73 million more. And I believe Paul, if I'm wrong, was it between $43 and $48 million we spent on the fires? So $48 million. Thank you. So we spent $48 million. That was combined on all the fires in this last year. So um, I appreciate the fact that the governor is doing that. He's also talking about paying back all of the funds that we uh, drained in order to pay for the, the fires that we had here. Um, Legislatively, just so you know, uh, there, today we, we um, the debate on second reading in the House had to do with the bill um, having to do with uh, sex education and in K through 12, and so and that will be voted on perhaps tomorrow, maybe not until later. Um, they, the, the the Speaker of the House, Representative Ferrandino, has been dropping bills very quickly, so I don't know what's coming. Um, there and, and they said there'll be a lot of late bills, so we don't really know what's coming when, and we really don't know what all the bills will be. There is a bill that's being discussed as far as repealing the death penalty. I talked to you about the, the gun bills will be going through, the, um, the undocumented student bill is going to be going through, the civil unions bill is going to be going through. There'll be a lot of different bills like that that will be going through. Um, the initiatives are supposed to be jobs in the economy, and I believe those some of those may be coming through. I am running a bill with the governor's office that does do um, a lot for, um, it's basically economic development do dollars for um, advanced industry like bioscience, clean tech, all the, uh, it's good for all the research universities. Um, it's a, it's, it's been a busy year, but it's a very different year. Um, and, you know, there are 28 Republicans, and see, I should probably be able to do the math, out of 65, the rest are Democrats. <laughs> so that means that the minority of the Republicans is large enough that um, the Democrats, they, they have full run. And so, and that's, you know, that's where we're at. <clears throat> Thank you, Angela. And that's basically where I, I will be around this evening if you have any other questions. Um, it's, uh, it's always wonderful that you all come out in the force you do. I appreciate the fact that Shirley tried to change locations and times to slip us all up. Thank you. But we still found her. And thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Bye. As we mentioned before, all of the speakers are um, sticking around to um, talk to you about whatever you'd like to talk to them about. Um, we have lots of other people that asked to have flyers and brochures and information here. Um, Jennifer with Creekside Insurance is actually here. She has an evacuation list. Um, that's going to help with my dream, and I hope that all of you will take that evacuation list and be ready so you don't have that same nightmare. Um, and I just want to, uh, we've got a lot of things going on. We've got a spring flame recycling event coming up. Uh, we've got the mountaineering home show, or, you know, there's just all kinds of things. The fire chiefs are here to talk. Um, they've got all kinds of stuff. Dana's in the back over here with all of his um, information. So please stick around, um, get as much information, talk as much as you would like. We do have to be out of here a little before nine, um, but I want to thank you so much for coming. And our next town hall meeting is April 17th, and they assured me it will be a Wednesday night, and it will be the night that we had actually decided to have it. So thank you so much for coming.